of Wagalugu's imams and preachers. In 1991, political and social liberalization reforms accompanied the adoption of the constitution of the Fourth Republic of Burkina Faso. In this context, various religious actors created private confessional media used for proselytism. It was the neo-Pentecostals and the Catholics who were initially the most active. Occasional gatherings and hotels and stadiums, as well as the use of posters, internet, and marketing of religious books, films, tapes, CDs, and DVDs, testify the visibility of Christian groups. Burkinabe public sphere thus quickly became an area of religious competition. In 2010, Burkina Faso had no less than 39 confessional radio stations and six confessional <coughs> television channels. In this context, Muslims wanted to respond to the vitality of Christians' group by providing greater visibility to Islam through the use of media. For many of them, it was now primordial to promote the brand image of Islam by using all audiovisual potential. Therefrom, some Islamic periodicals appear. And while Christians and Pentecostalists founded religious radios in the 90s, it was not until the next decade that Islamic radios appeared in Burkina Faso. In Ouagadougou, the first private Islamic radio channel, Radio Aluda, was launched in December 2004. The second one, Ridwan pour le développement, is broadcast, broadcasting since March 2010. More recently, in spring 2012, the first Islamic television channel, Television Aluda, was launched. In addition to the spread of Islamic media, some French speakers, imams, and preachers affiliated with the AEEMB and the Serfi benefit from a greater presence in the public sphere by their appearance on non confessional radio, television, and press. Other imams have also a television visibility with the weekly show uh, Fate of a Believer on the public service broadcaster RTV Television. The sale of audio cassettes, CDs, and DVDs of sermons and preaching in numerous stands near mosques accentuated the visibility of some prominent figures. The figure of the imam or preacher is only present in the pockets. In addition to the more traditional media, Muslims are using more commonly the internet. For example, the AEMB created a website in 2007 and updated it regularly. Sermons and preaching of several figures are also available online for download from the website of Muslim of Burkina Faso, created in 2012. On the home page, it is possible to listen to the latest Friday sermons from some significant mosque in the capital. A section named Sermons offers numerous MP3 records sorted by the preacher or imam. The site is quite complete with the presence of different thematic sections. The Muslim of Burkina Faso is even on social media with Facebook and Google Plus pages and a Twitter account. By using those, uh, these modern mediums, it is also a way for attracting converts from different social classes. Even if the mediatization of Islam in Burkina Faso is not as much important as in Mali or Côte d'Ivoire, the more regular broadcasts of religious shows and the broad distribution of sermons on various mediums gave a significant visibility to various Burkina Bay imams and preachers. The hyper-mediatization tends to characterize Arabists as well as French speakers, young men as well as elders. A renewed sense of legitimacy and religious authority is built around these highly visible imams and preachers. 
the mediatization characterizing these Muslim figures is not necessarily linked to the acquisition of foreign knowledge in the greatest religious Islamic universities, but also a lot to the oratorical skills and charisma. It is now also a matter of knowing how to use media with success in order to better publicize the religious message and attract the attention of followers. In this context, the older imams of some mosques, mosques are increasingly calling upon young imams in the preparation of Friday sermons and their broadcasting. Indeed, since the 90s, there is a dynamic of cooperation between generations. Young men's particip participation in Muslim activism is noteworthy and contribute to the model dynamics of intergenerational relationships. Imam's College has been established in several mosques in Ouagadougou from different associations. This reflects a desire to break with the older structure of authority where a single imam exclusively delivered Friday sermons. As a consequence, it allowed the rotation of younger and older imams uh, for the delivery of sermons. While conflicts and tensions still persist, youth and elders increasingly brought their effort together in order to enhance their proselytizing efforts. Elders saw the importance of working with youth and recognizing their level of knowledge and ease with new media in order to improve the work of the Dawah. Despite the social and political liberalization in Burkina Faso and the higher mediatization of some imams and preachers since 1991, Muslims' discourses did not, did not become more politically oriented. They are rather characterized by a standardization of its contents. Two reasons can explain this. On one hand, the Burkinabe state fear increasing tensions between different religious groups. In consequence, it put in place strict regulations for radio and television sectors. For example, the Conseil Supérieur de la Communication, CSE, makes sure that, that confessional radios broadcast a minimum of 20% of non-religious programs. The CSE insists also on the secularism of the state. On the other hand, Islamic radios exercise also a firm control on the content of their broadcasts. In this sense, the sermons of the imams and preachers are pre-recorded before being broadcasted. The manager of the Razio Idwan once told me that the absence of live feed allows them to make sure that the content of the broadcast meets the established standards. This verification occurs also on Radio Aluda. Thus, the use of media has led to the adoption of more restrained speeches in many cases. Imam's discourses remain also largely apolitical. The imams of the Sunni movement are characterized by, by their distrust of politics, and the situation is similar to many of the imams affiliated with the CNBA and those from the Sufi trend. <coughs> For them, political subjects are a taboo which is not part of the responsibilities associated with their function. Indeed, many imams and preachers in their view, uh, during my empirical researches, seem to practice self-censorship because of the fear of being the victim of retaliation on the part of the state. Um, this uh, is to be understood in the, co uh, understand in the context of uh, the particular political context of Kampari regime. As stated by Ilgers and Mazuchiti, democratic transition in Burkina Faso led to a semi-authoritarian regime. The Burkinabe Muslim elites are largely in a position of political clientelism. Young imams affiliated with the AEENB and SURFI are more engaged in social and political debates. Most of them have attended public secular French-speaking schools. They even sometimes criticize the government. However, however, most political speeches find a way to express their view without expli explicitly naming Kampari regime. For this purpose, using the early days of Islam as a government's model are used to criticize the government. It is also easier for imams and preachers to speak of sub-regional and international news than national news because it does not affect national policy of President Kampari. More important, imams and preachers affiliated with the AEEMB and SURFI, as well as others from different Muslim associations, are seeking to moralize Burkina society. In their speeches, they regularly discuss the moral decline, the superficial practice of 
religious faith and the westernization of morals. Frequent calls were made for a return to fundamental Islamic values, honesty, solidarity, and work, the fight against corruption, juvenile delinquency, and the innocent women's clothing. By investing in the public sphere, these actors have the desire to spread a set of social, religious, and moral standards. The remoralization of the individual is based on the figure of the good Muslim. It is characterized by a virtuous life. These instructions put the focus on behavior and dress codes. It, is also a it has also a collective side in order to create an exemplary community that will obey to the prophetic <coughs> message. Muslims are thereby considered as moral subjects, participating through their actions in a remoralization of their social environment. The figure of the Muslim, uh, the Muslim is closely linked to citizen engagement. By proposing a Muslim citizenship, these imams and preachers offer an alternative to tradition as well as the Western modernity. They do not reject modernity, but rather reconfigure and adapt it according to the principles of the Quran. This vision of a religion somehow totalizing involves a cultural revolution in which people become the church and on a set of ethical standards, these imams and preachers assign themselves the role of spiritual guide by showing the way for the creation of a new society. The relationship between religion and society evolved to the point that, that it has become possible to speak in terms of a re new religious culture which led to the emergence of a religious public sphere. Okay, I'm done because I know it's, uh, okay, thank it's you only so 10 minutes. So. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, <laughs> If I may, um, just uh, because I got this paper, we were ahead of um, these uh, events, I'd like to just uh, provide a kind of a summary of what um, it touched on. Uh, first, the struggle for visibility by uh, religious sects in Ugadogu. And secondly, we have uh, tension and competition between these religious you know, sects, Islam and uh, Christianity. And thirdly, uh, the generational struggle. Uh, within the Islamic set, you know, uh, Islamic you know, leadership, the youth and the uh, elderly ones uh, in controlling um, the religion within the state and controlling the public. And then uh, we have the quest for social morality. And lastly, the strategic diplomacy deployed by the um, religious leaders in order to maintain their foothold within that society. You know, so these are some of the key points you know, uh, highlighted in this paper that we may want to um, take on by the time we want to start you know, questioning and doing some comments. So we'll move on to the next speaker, um, Ademi Kerry, from Kerry Fadi, uh, for our presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Telegraph, but today the use of the mass media and information and communicating 
communication technologies via tools such as computers, internet, and mobile phones brings a larger diversity of agents, agents to the conversation in many directions, such as appreciating diversities, solving problems, sharing uh, experiences, and voicing out opinions without fear. In previous times, the world leader have um, struggled to develop effective communication channels to serve the people. In the ICT era, the custom of media has rapidly changed. New opportunities are risen for greater freedom of expression, even though, at the same time, new threats are also emerging. The use of media in the uplift and stability of national growth and security is greatly contributing to the promotion of peace. Uh, you know, media serves as a channel for information exchange and to create understanding among different groups in societies. It's evident that conflicts arise due to the lack of discussion as well as misunderstanding among conflicting parties. Therefore, the use of mass media can be a path towards peace and security, embracing the participatory governance principle through user-friendly, harmonized, and effective management tools and mechanisms. Based on that, media and ICTs have, in the past years, you know, have helped significantly to improve the well-being of individuals and communities at risk. In the age of the information society, social media give a new meaning to human rights, particularly freedom of expression and information, by promoting success to knowledge, mutual understanding, and ways to reveal uh, human rights abuses and promote transparent governance. I think I have to speak a bit because of the time frame. On top of that, mass media and the information technology offer ways to disclose human rights abuses, promote transparent governance, and give people living under um, repressive regimes access to free information to make public the injustices they suffer and ask for support. Despite the fact that ICTs can co significantly contribute to peace building and conflict management, holding the potential to be positively used in this respect. Negative aspects and limitations should be equally recognized. Freedom of the press. All over the world, press freedom is under one kind of threat or the other. Since democracy um, initiates a, a constant battle between different forces in society, most people are seen demanding freedom for themselves. Unfortunately, these people do not carry along this enthusiasm for demanding freedom when they are in power. This is often because at this stage, they now face challenges both from political and journalistic oppositions. Those who uh, require freedom of uh, expression, freedom of information, when they get to power, it's a different story. These struggles are important because they define the scope of press freedom in the different countries. Um, People should be given free and unimpeded um, access to news and information. According to him, freedom, freedom of the press is therefore the relative absence of governmental, economic, and other controls in the operation of the press. Given this scenario, it's obvious that the future for press freedom is still bleak because most African governments are not willing to fully succumb to the demands of absolute press freedom. Limits to press freedom of the press. Limits to freedom of the press. There's no absolute freedom, there's no absolute freedom anywhere, even in the freest societies in the world. The freedom or right of one person or the press to publish should not destroy the right of another man or the right of society to exist and be saved from the effect of wrongful, harmful, defamatory or mysterious publications. Therefore, the press has freedom and equal responsibility that goes with, the, with that freedom. There's freedom, but there has to be uh, some uh, responsibility that goes with it. It has a right and a duty. For every right of freedom that is claimed or enjoyed, there's a corresponding duty. In the words of uh, Denny, he says, to our way of thinking, it is elementary that each man should be able to inquire and seek after truth until he has found it. Everyone in the land should be free to think his own thoughts, have his own opinion, and give voice to them, in public or in private. In short, while the press wants absolute and unhindered freedom, the freedom has to be limited in the overall interest of people, of everyone in society, including the press. By, it has to be limited by the constitution, by the legislature, the courts, and the government. 
Functions of the media, let's go to functions of the media in promoting national peace and stability. The mass media perform numerous functions in the society. The media scholar has well observed that the mass media are an extension of those functions that the society has always needed. Most importantly, whether the media are functional or dysfunctional, they operate within the social system, and that is actually why it concerns us. The media uh, perform three major social functions, that is surveillance of the environment, to correlation of different uh, elements of society, the transmission of culture from one generation to the next, and also uh, entertainment, and then the right for inf to information. When we talk about surveillance of, of the environment, media teach us, uh, teaches us um, uh, most of what we know about the world around us, the process of surveillance. The media exposes us also to other societies. The media reveals to us issues like the stock market, and, uh, incredible danger, business opportunities and risks, travelers' guides, weather, and, uh, and, and so on. This is achieved and by exposing also individuals to large audiences for one good reason or the other to make them appear important and esteemed. This process is known as status conferral. The media does that as well. Correlation of different elements of the society. This is an important function of the mass media. It involves selection, evaluation, and interpretation of events. And then also um, the media you know, teaches and promotes uh, different stories that are around in the world. You have the socialization and transmission of culture. Culture is being transferred by media. We have programs that uh, discuss just about culture. You understand the culture of people that are far away from you. This allows for socialization. And also, through um, role models in entertainment and programming, one is able to build a future to have a focus. Through goals and desires, this you know, also presented in media citizenship values portrayed in the news. Entertainment helps you know, relaxing people, and through entertainment, you can even pass see important messages like that has to do with like, the HIV, AIDS, and also and all that through drama and entertainment. And that's the work of the media. I'll move them. Surely the media have to perform their surveillance duty by giving us information we need to do and warn us about dangers to our state. To our state. However, however, the media's dysfunction with regards to crime and terrorism make people think that the world is unsafe to live in. It means that when media is doing this, they have to take caution to make sure that the world it's not scared and they, you know, they, they are given the right direction. This is because most people believe that the media present to them, what they present to them is absolute truth. When you watch television, what you see, you believe as, that this is absolute truth. The pictures about events and the world presented by media, mass media and therefore seen as authentic because of the powerful nature of new media, of information. More, many political leaders lean heavily on them, afraid to control their excesses. Such leaders and media product, uh, products consumers now comfortably hide under the spiral of silence theory. Mass media systems. The, me the media system that exists in the country is directly related to the political system in that country. <laughs> go to, just go to the towards uh, conclusion. Yeah, I'll conclude now. So national development and uh, security, I just go to conclusion. Uh, it has been published, it has been established so far that the Nigerian press first emergence in a political arena is not to serve the political <coughs> interest of rulers, but to expose the atrocities which is being committed by some class of persons who use government as a shield. But a lot was done in silencing them beginning from the colonial era. You know, and, uh, because of this, you have a situation where uh, people have to be, uh, be careful in whatever they do because of the media. Media has been able to expose corrupt officers and also affected people's perception of corruption. It is on this basis of a separate of objective of the Nigerian president that I agree, you know, that we cannot deny the fact that we as a nation are asking too much from the media, especially the print media. However, the public was pushed to be asking too much from the first exit of the realm because it appears whenever the press sneezes, politicians, especially the lawless ones, catch cold. Consequently, only politicians, even 
by the concept of patriotism, honesty, and who mean well for Nigerians will stimulate the passing of the Freedom of Information Bill. I therefore recommend that as watchdogs, the society, the society mass media portrayal should promote transparent democratic governance and bring to the public view political and religious leaders who find the embers of uh, criminal and terrorist destructive activities. While trained journalists on crime coverage should be the ones allowed to do so, such journalists by their training would know what are ethical and presidential what are proper for the to disseminate to the public. Journalists should, as a matter of natural, national security, not write or broadcast on direct utterances of security agents with regards to logistical plans to root out criminals and terrorists from our civilized society. Uh, media practitioners, as a matter of agenda setting, should promote the basic doctrines of love, peace, universal brotherhood, freedom, justice, human rights, patience, tolerance, equity, and non-violence. Where all these are in turn, national security, peace, and development of human and material resources will be the order of the day. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, key issues uh, that I would like to quickly uh, bring up from her presentation. She addressed conceptual issues on human rights, uh, and then went on to uh, highlight the you know, media role and its transparency in reporting democratic processes. I'll uh, bring to the fore the impact of ICT, singling out ICT, and how it's applied in the democratic uh, process, you know, highlighting both the negative and positive aspects of it and the implications on the society, you know, going on to give us the ABC, you know, uh, um, impact, you know, of, of this um, unit. And then we have uh, the promise of ICT. She tried to highlight, you know, what promises you know, uh, the ICT and the media, you know, uh, has for, for the country and made recommendations on its stability for effective electionary uh, process. But the question, you know, still arises, you know, you know to what degree uh, do we uh, talk about you know, the media and the ICT in terms of their relevance you know, for ensuring peace and security in the Nigerian case, you know, and how far, you know, how effective, you know, they have been able to, at the two levels, you know, have actually been able to perform the work dog work in the Nigerian context. So with that, uh, at the back of our mind, we we'll move on to the next presenter. Is, um, yeah, the next presenter we're going to skip back because she's not here, so we'll move on to Zachary J. Patterson. Oh, okay, he's also not here, so we'll move on to Ruby Koya. So we'll see how time. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. So I, I take permission to stand up so that I can just speak to the paper. Um, I'm talking on sustainable democratization through ICT driven electoral petition tribunal in Nigeria. The intention in this paper is to try and see how democracy can be institutionalized through our legal system. Now, Nigeria has a peculiar, what well, is, I uh, wouldn't want to call it peculiar because virtually every country in the world that practices democracy have certain features common to all of them. Now, I want to present this paper by asking questions and trying to answer those questions in order to present the paper. Um, the first question I have there is whether there is democracy in Africa in African setting. Now, the democracy has been said to be, in the layman's language, government of the people by the people. Now, but there are certain features which are very important in democracy, talking about democracy. The United Nations tried to guide us and also Certain scholars have tried to highlight most important issues where features of democracy. I want to refer to Dow 1998, in which he mentioned five elements. For him, democracy involves effective participation of the people, equality in voting, gaining enlightened understanding 
exercising final control over the agenda of government and inclusion of all adults. Now, the Universal Declaration of Democracy provides as follows. It says the key element in the exercise of democracy is the holding of free and fair elections at regular intervals, enabling the people's will to be expressed. These elections must be held on the basis of universal, equal, and secret suffrage so that all voters can choose their representatives in conditions of equality, openness, and transparency that stimulates political competition. To that end, civil and political rights are essential, and more particularly among them, the right to vote and to be elected. The rights to freedom of expression and assembly, access to information, and the right to organize political parties and carry out our political activities party organization, activities, finances, funding, and ethics must be properly regulated in an impartial manner in order to ensure the integrity of the democratic processes. Now, I want to just quickly allude to my own ethnic group in Nigeria, the Yorubas. And I want to see whether we can get an analogy of democracy from it. There, where we want to choose a leader, the leader there is called an Oba, a king. He practice something similar to the monarchical system of government. Well, I notice that there are some features of democracy therein. First, there are families that are eligible to be selected as Obas. Now, they have some people they call kingmakers who come together, they do this election. So there's also something like election, isn't it? Okay, I'm not too sure whether it's not too close to the Electoral College. I know there is a body like that. <laughs> now, but the point is this. They have a way of electing a person to position of authority. But the problem here now is this, which is the challenge. I want to say that, I said, if there is, what are the features? I've just mentioned the aspect of some kind of election. But the difference which is most important there and which has been highlighted is the issue of tenureship. In democracy, uh, or ideal democracy, it is usually believed that a person who is elected has a term to spend. Now, we have our own philosophy. And that philosophy, I will first say it in my language. It says, when a king gets to power, it's like, long live the king. But it goes beyond that in my own language. They say, Adia Pelori, Adia is crown. But our fellow say, what that means is that that king, you will remain king forever. So there's no tenure. Your tenure is a lifetime. Now, that is the cultural and psychological background from which we are coming with our own democracy. Now, I want to relate it to the issue of democracy in Nigeria. Now, so it becomes a very difficult. Now, I refer to somebody who also tried to highlight certain issues in America from here with Minnesota, Biola, 2012. She made some observation about the American um, electoral system, trying to relate it to Africa. I don't want to bore you with that. But where I'm going to is this. The typical setting why we are having certain challenges in our democratic system is the fact that our philosophy is quite different. And so, a person who becomes elected into a position of government wants to remain perpetually in power. There's a challenge of tenureship. Now, but because we are trying to institutionalize democracy, so there's a challenge. And that challenge is this. When I'm elected, I still want to find every other means of continuing election. But the Constitution has given us time. So, three minutes, OK. Now, so, now, the, it's all boiled down to the fact that there is now the challenge of acceptance of when you are elected, you don't want to stay within that term. And so, incumbency wants to perpetuate itself in power, and there are new people who want to also come in to take that power and also move. When elections take place, it becomes 
difficult for also parties who believe that we are just coming to you. I want to refer to the Zimbabwean problem. You remember that Mugabe has remained in power for how many years? Really three. I don't want to mention it, but it's a typical way of thinking that what has to be made. Now, when election takes place, that's another scenario. Parties hardly ever want to agree that the other person has won. And where I'm going is the issue of who now settles this dispute, who solves the problem to make democracy work. And that's where the court system comes in. Now, the court system is sort of in isolation. The court becomes pressured by parties in dispute. And there have been allegations of corruption in terms of the highest bidder, such problems. So now, trying to look at that problem, we felt, is it not possible to find a way of resolving that problem by removing the human interface? I'm not saying the human interface should be removed entirely, it cannot be removed entirely, to avoid some element of corruption, to bring in transparency a transparent system through the use of ICT facilities. Now, meaning that, right, because the court itself cannot determine disputes in election petitions without having sufficient information, uh, sufficient evidence. So I have to close to The court cannot determine issues except they have sufficient evidence. So it has been proposed here that for the courts to be able to handle election problems, certain things must be done. We first identify some manipulations, predetermined manipulations. Electoral administration has to be properly handled. And that starts with registration of voters. And what we're saying here is that ICT makes it possible for us to take biometric data of every eligible voter. That's where to start from. And then, moving forward, because we have to establish a situation where the data captured cannot be resident in only one aspect of institutions because of mutual mistrust. So we are suggesting in this paper that it is necessary that when the data capture, taking the biometrics data of elect, 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 um, proposed um, prospective electorates being taken, they should go to three divisions. So I'm trying to open my word here. Did the table. Okay, yes. No, I have this in the system, so I just wanted to yeah, view it. So I was now thinking that, look, we are proposing a model. That model says, as each voter is being registered, registered by taking the biometrics, we have three nodes. The database will be resident in three places. The election, electoral commission, the national assembly, and then the Supreme Court. Now, all of them will have exactly the same data at the same time as that registration is being done. Now again, for election, when the election is taking place, the election also, this time, we are suggesting that it should no longer be by manual voting. It should be by, in 1993, which was said called to be the best election, Option A4, the court is option A4, instituted by one professor Umosu, who was the chairman of the Each individual had to signify <laughs> their intention of supporting a particular. We had two parties. You raise up your hand, you queue up, you raise up your hand, and we ascertain the people for whom you are voting for, right there and then. Now, but translating this to bringing it to ICT environment, we're saying each uh, poll will have the same systems ready for electronic voting as you are voting. The votes you cast is also reflected in the same three nodes, databases, such that the Supreme Court has the database of the way the voting is done. 
the National Assembly has, INEC has. Now, when election dispute arises and you come to court, the court does not only rely on the evidence brought by the aggrieved party, the court can also rely on the database that they have. If there is disparity, if there is disparity in the data that they have, it will be easy to ascertain whether or not they have been election malpractice. Now, in concluding, I want to say that I'm not saying ICT is just we are proposing it in, uh, at the moment as a stopgap measure in order to bring in transparency and to develop an institution where over time people will begin to trust one another and then the system can work on its own. Thank you very much. Yes, sorry. <laughs> As provider of us, you know, with uh, some issues to think about, um, definitions of democracy, and then raise questions uh, to which you try to provide answers to on uh, the democratic uh, process and what is actually, you know, the correct uh, uh, democracy to, to practice. Uh, you call into question, question and also to witness uh, scholarship on. on uh, democracy and democratic process, uh, raising issues of uh, what is the ideal tenureship and how do people actually adhere to this kind of uh, tenureship. And you also raised uh, questions about uh, the um, transparency and uh, comments about the complicity of the judiciary in the Nigerian uh, example. Um, <coughs> highlighted shortcomings of democratic process. But basically, we recommend you know, the ICT as an you know, appropriate uh, tool to use in ensuring good democracy uh, in Nigeria. But the question arises, is ICT essentially free of human element? Mm. And secondly, is a society, the society which you cite as your study focus, adequately ICT compliant? to rise to the challenge of the ICT-driven electoral process? These are some of the questions that you may begin to think of to uh, you know, add to what uh, members of the audience will also bring up to you. So I'll move up to the last um, presenter, um, Essien Okay, I'm here. Yeah. Uh, good evening, good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. Yes, I want to give you the Indian indulgence. My paper will not be shown here on the screen. <laughs> <laughs> because of the circumstances. My topic is the actual on Borough of the Cross and Star, the protest against Western Christianity. Uh, I, I would like to give you the background of the founder of this movement before I go on to talk about it. The founder of this movement had never claimed never, not to have gone to school before. He is an English teacher, does not speak English, he speaks only the vernacular language of ethnic and Islam. Where he comes from Vietnam. Brotherhood of the Cross and Star is one of the, 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 one of the fastest growing independent movements in Nigeria, founded by the man they call leader Olumba Olumba Ubu, otherwise called O -O -O -O. And Brotherhood of the Cross and Star is sometimes called BC. This movement has spread you know, to several African countries Europe, Africa, Trinidad and Tobago. America, and so on and so forth, even Cameroon, Congo, Republic, and so on. The success of this movement is attributed to the, leader, uh, the, the, the leader's charisma and the spiritual power, as well as his, the unique organization, teaching, and belief of the movement. That is we know, where the success comes from. The, what the movement does now, the BCS challenges the authenticity and relevance of other religious traditions. The word I use here you know, to, to, to protest is used in the study to indicate either the SGCS rejection or radical disagreement with or objection to the uh, or departure completely from the beliefs and practices of Orthodox Western Christianity in Nigeria. BCS sees Western Christianity as irrelevant to Nigeria's social structure or social condition. Against this background, it seeks to provide an alternative 
progressive and relevant religious system by promising, this work is more of a narrative, please, I want to mention that, by promising to usher a millennium, a, a completely new golden age of God's kingdom and earth founded by him. To achieve this, the movement through its beliefs and practices protests against the religious system it seeks to replace. It's, uh, you know, it's, you know, in its expression of African initiative and creativity. This year formulates new, uh, new and different theological doctrines strange to Christianity. This study now examines specific beliefs and practices of BCS, which are contrary to the, the tenets, ideas, and values of Orthodox Christianity, and attempts to show this work now attempts to show how these unique beliefs and practices are used, you know, as instruments of protest against Western cultural Christianity. The specific belief in this practice, in this, uh, this specific beliefs and practices which are unique to the movement and up to Christianity include apotheosis of Mida Olumba Lumbapu. That is one. And it believes that itself is the instrument of uh, the instrument of the biblical predictions about the kingdom of God on earth. Again, another one is the concept of reincarnation in the movement you know, and the celebration of the manifestation of the Holy Spirit on earth, as well as the celebration of the Queen Mother's Day. These are major uh, you know, things that a uh, movement has used to protest against Western Christianity. Looking at the advertisement of Olumba and Olumbaku, well, the leader himself is considered to be God in human form. They believe that he has come down to set up a new kingdom, that Rufu himself has come down to set a new kingdom here on earth, you know, with the leader as the head of this kingdom. And this same movement believes that God has incarnated eight times with the Olumba and Olumbaku as the last of incarnation of God. And it also believes that Obu is, you know, that Obu is omnipotent, that he is omnipotent, omnipresent, and has control over principalities. Several members of this, of this movement have testified to the divine attribute of Olumbo and Olumbo Obu. Some members, even an Indian uh, mystic, even testified to having seen the Olumbo and Olumbo Obu on his only presence in India. Again, another belief is the belief in reincarnation of this reincarnation. The movement believes that God had not created any human being again after the creation of Adam. And it teaches that Elijah reincarnated as John. And it also believes that whoever dies will certainly reincarnate or regenerate. And the, and the process goes on and on and on, you know, as it pleases the Creator or until one becomes what the woman refers to as a, a child of resurrection. And it goes on to believe that the process of regeneration is, you know, not the end itself, but is a means to an end. Therefore, one must work very hard after regeneration to attain what the woman refers to as multiplication of the flesh, which according to them is a state we are one can serve God, and if you get to this thing, you can answer it God. You can see that this belief is similar to that of the Hindu concept of samsara, you know, samsara, you know, that one can reincarnate as many times as possible and at different places. In the book holds that, that some people, when some people die in India or America, they can reincarnate in Nigeria. While people are here, when somebody dies in Nigeria, can reincarnate in America or England. While people here are crying, the fellow has reincarnated somewhere. There has been reborn, a reincarnation in being reborn into another country. So normally, the members of this movement never spoke of anybody dying. They would say if he has gone on transfer, they would rejoice when somebody passes on. You know, you know this year in the state in now holds up that there is no death, you know, that men do not die. There is no death. Man can be compared to a young tuba when planted dies and brings forth another tuba. So that is it. Again, another, uh, 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 celebration which the movement celebrates 
that is completely contrary to the Christian celebration is the manifestation of the Holy Spirit on earth. It celebrates the manifestation of the Lumba Lumba. But according to BCS, this celebration goes to appreciate God, the Father, the Son, and the, uh, the Son and the Holy Spirit for coming down to dwell with man. He will himself for coming down to dwell with man on death amidst man's sin. That when he has come down to live with us and face our own sin. That the celebration you know, of the reception of the Holy Spirit, you know, you know in this VCS is similar to what uh, to Christ, uh, the Christian Christmas, you know, which is celebrated during Christmas. Where the celebration takes place at the end of December, the 30th of December. Another celebration that is peculiar to this moment is the celebration of the Queen's Mother's Day. This is an annual celebration which you know, rotates among different zones of women fellowship in Nigeria and in fact in other countries of the world they celebrate this. The celebration was instituted through the divine order of the leader himself. You know, he said he, he, this was the uh, <coughs> celebrated that you know it is a a kind of uh, you know, trying to uh, fulfill the other, uh, to fulfill the revelation in the Bible, which the, what we came through divine instruction, that Father Luma Luma should, should be commemorated, you know, that the mother of this woman, the, the, the founder, should be commemorated on earth. So, Luma Luma Luma's mother, who is the queen mother, is celebrated. Uh, this passage, you know, in the Bible, is, uh, you know, I don't want to read the passage. So, what we, what we now can conclude that, you know, what Brown has done as the celebration of the Queen Mother celebration replaces Roman Catholic celebration of the months of Rosary, Peace of Organization, and so By these celebrations and this year now attempts to indigenize the biblical stories about the Virgin Mary. He tries to indigenize the whole concept of Christianity in Nigeria. And in fact, to replace that, it wants to be replaced by Olumba, Brotherhoodism, uh, which is completely different from Christianity. So, in fact, it does not want Christianity as it is in its Western cultural form. It should also be indigenized to become a Nigerian uh, religion. It's, it's not good to rest my Thank you very much. the origin of um, BCS, Brotherhood of the Cross and Star, a uh, religious sect that uh, emerged in Nigeria and founded by a leader. Of course, the provider does not believe in leader. And I want to uh, inform us about you know, the spread of the movement by fusion to other spaces. Uh, and then uh, uh, highlighting the success of uh, the region in terms of uh, the, the creed, the, the, the profile of the leader, uh, and then certain things that the BCS uh, objects to uh, in the practices of Western Christianity, what he calls Western Christian, Christianity. Um, certain things you know, that they also uh, totally disagree with. The major critic of Western Christianity is brought before here. Um, I was uh, actually thinking ahead, you know, before he, he, he mentioned the fact that um, some of the profiles of um, BCS has some features of Buddhism. Um, the quest to overcome Nirvana, uh, to, to overcome Sansara and attain uh, Nirvana. Some questions that I <coughs> want us you know, to begin to think about is, and you also to begin to think about before I open the floor, uh, is that how is the CBCS different from other monotheistic uh, religion in terms of its origin, in terms of its profile, in terms of its celebrations of certain activities? Is uh, BCS not an amalgam of various you know, sects or various religious things? Uh, I'm seeing syncretism here, I'm seeing eclectism, you know, burning and then meshing all this together to form something. Uh, it would be nice, although you provided the, di the diffusion of this religious sect, it would be nice for us to know, you know, the central population of this you know, religious sect now, for us to actually get a grasp of the 
the, the success or successes of this human agency. But I also think, in some sense, uh, there's a contradiction here. Whereas you, you, you have allowed us to think of you know, the, 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 the potentiality of BCS in its, in, in its propagation to other spaces. But you ended you know, by saying you know, that there's this you know, struggle and this quest to make it a Nigerian religion and an indigenous you know, religion. So I couldn't actually reconcile you know, these two parameters. But I'll leave um, the audience you know, to tease out some of these questions. So the floor is now open. Uh, for us to engage in you know, some of the issues that uh, these presenters have uh, addressed in their wonderful presentation. So I'll take a round of three, four questions. I uh, would allow the presenters to respond, and then we'll take another round. Yeah, my I'd like to um, address this question to the first speaker, okay. and possibly the last. Um, the more, uh, this was a quotation from C.G. Jung, uh, the great Swiss psychiatrist, who died in 1961. And he said that um, the more dogmatic a religion is, the more it divides humanity into warring communities. It doesn't matter what the religion is. It could be Islam, Christianity, or Judaism. It doesn't matter which religion it is. Okay. Um, next, and then you. No. Okay. So. Um, Mine are two questions to the second speaker, uh, who I think has gone out, I don't know. Uh, and then uh, Mr. Olugasa. Maybe I can start with Olugasa first. <laughs> oh, okay. Just in time. Um, yeah, my, my question to her is, um, don't you think that you are putting too much faith uh, in the media? Uh, in Africa, we know that uh, in Rwanda and a few other places, the media was uh, at the center uh, of accusations uh, for inciting um, certain communities uh, to kill each other. And uh, what is the media uh, in Nigeria doing to ensure that it is not going to be used uh, in this way, like in Rwanda and uh, elsewhere? And then for Mr. Uh, Olugasa, um, I come from Kenya, and right now the two main political parties are in court. Uh, and uh, part of the problem is that uh, uh, the BVR uh, machines that you have so much faith in, uh, they were used. And uh, still we are having some uh, you know, uh, disputes in the electoral uh, outcome. Can we really uh, have too much faith? Uh, in technology, uh, you know, that's my question. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, so uh, my name is Amin Kaur, and, and uh, uh, my, I have a couple of questions. First, for the paper on Burkina Faso, uh, my my question is: How does the uh, uh, religious media we were talking about, the various radio stations and television stations and websites and whatnot? Um, uh, challenge or subvert the power of the state. But I know you said that they're, they self-censor and they do all this, but I, I assume that there is there is a subversive element somewhere you've managed to tease out in your research or whatever, because why else are they doing this? Yeah. Um, so I'm just curious what you think uh, about that. Uh, and then I'll, for the uh, uh, second paper, to what extent does the media further, you, you mentioned something about nonviolence movements or something like that. I'm not sure if you just use nonviolence as an adjective or if you actually meant to talk about it in a deeper uh, sense. So my question is to what extent does the media further nonviolent politics? And then also sort of secondarily, um, the uh, theoretical framework that you use. I was curious, you mentioned systems, but I know you didn't have time to talk about it. So I was curious if you looked at people like Noam Chomsky or Bob McChesney, uh, people who actually do um, sort of uh, media studies and looking at 
um, the way in which the media is <coughs> kept by the state. So for example, the critique in the United States is um, that uh, uh, most of the press that you read about or listen to in the news here is uh, derivative of the state. So what we read about in the news is defined by what the Republicans and Democrats are talking about. So if they're talking about it, then we'll, we'll read newspaper articles about it. So in that sense, it's not an independent press. We don't have a free press in that standard sense of the word here. Um, so I just sort of point in that direction. I'm curious what you think about that. And then finally, for the third paper, what uh, or how does your definition of democracy influence um, your solution uh, in information and communication technology? Um, it seems to me that you have a, a fairly conservative understanding of democracy insofar as you use you cite Dahl, for example. And I'm curious, because my, my sense of Dahl is that he's not very democratic, actually, right? He's, he's really interested in what elites have to say, and the masses get to vote on which elite position, which has already been predetermined within sort of elite discourse. And it's democratic insofar as sort of like, I don't know, democratic centralism or something like that, where you've got five people who they get to vote, and then everybody else gets to vote on, you know, which one of those five positions on democracy um, we get to, to choose from. So Dahl is really better understood as polyarchy, which is really just elite democracy. Um, and unfortunately, here in the United States, again, that tends to be the version that, that it gets used a lot, and I would like to see that being propagated around the world in Nigeria and elsewhere. So just throw those comments out. Making a comment in the paper on uh, the media. The issue of corruption is a big one in Nigeria. And, uh, I don't really know how the media can help to eradicate it because I think that was the word. I know for sure that the media is helping to publicize the corruption in the society, but I don't know how they are helping to cope it because both home and abroad. Everybody knows the rights of our nation. And it's from the reports we get from the media. Mm -hmm. Advertising people buy the bus, read, and see their color. But I, I don't know to what extent they have come to the right places. Because all the cases, all the allegations of corruption we have had, I can't remember anyone that was either jail, return money, anything that we are often told. So we I want you to know the difference between eradicating this possible. In the one on uh, democracy, yes, this is good ideas. Like others have expressed, how to need to implement things. You know, the level of technological development in Nigeria. The process itself will be faulted because many people who are qualified to vote will not even be captured by this technology. In many communities, no light. In some places, the machines are not working. They tried it in the last uh, registration exercise. So, considering the level of our technology, I want to think this will create more problems than it will solve. Thank you. And lastly, the paper on the uh, oh, oh, oh. But uh, the president has said the man, the society, or the religion, believes that. Man does not die. And goes on to say that the city Olumba is the AIDS. If man does not die, how is he the AIDS? Or I would say he is the eighth, the one that has died in many places and has reincarnated in eight places. That is one thing I was trying to think about. The second thing is the issue of uh, reincarnation. Where you say a man reincarnates as many times as it places the creator. Who is the creator? Because when you started, I think we were saying that Olumba is God himself. He has come down in his form. We just want the presenter to be able to you know, address you know, this question. So if you have too many clusters, then you have to So if I remember well the first question um, about being dogmatic uh, from some Slamming groups. Uh, I don't think it's, it's the case for some associations and working up as especially the Sunni movement. But I spoke uh, about AEMB and Serfi. Uh, these are two uh, French, uh, two Muslims associations of French 
speaking Muslims and they are quite open to discussion and to democracy and they insist a lot of uh, respecting other religious groups and they put the focus on being a good citizen, a good Muslim citizen. For example, uh, I have a quotation, that I don't have the time to, to present it. Um, it says, uh, faith becomes a factor of individual, individual and collective development. Because the Muslim carries a societal project, the community in which he lives, he must take advantage of his faith. Therefore, a good Muslim is a good citizen. Our Muslim identity urges us to take a civic commitment on behalf of God for men to act to build a community. So they, they put the focus on being a good, a good citizen and to be open to other religious groups. So I don't think it's quite the case, being dogmatic and it's not a big issue, I think, at Burkina Faso. Something to add? I think the question was for me and maybe. Uh, it's okay for me. I know. It's a part of the problem. So. You can respond to your. Okay. Uh, I think uh, Ulumba Ulumba as many as many times as possible. Members have said that he himself was the last God. That he was God that reincarnated in Moses, Elijah. You know, what they mean by reincarnation is not dead, but appearing in different forms. For this time around, he has reincarnated in the form of man. He has come back in the form of man. And the creator, when somebody dies, the, the members do not say the person has died. They say he has gone on mission that the death has sent him. So this is what God is talking about. It's him. It is him. But this is a little from the point of a, 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 a scholar, an academic scholar. I don't want to pass any value on him because I have seen him shortly by the time he had, he had become so weak and become so weak and blind. I saw him, and I saw him when he was very strong. But so there are many things I reserve to myself as a scholar. <clears throat> but uh, many people still believe that he's alive because he has, you know, he, he's still living as a god. Members here do not even know that he's. Members in America still believe that he's very much alive. Here. Even those in Canada believe that he's very much alive as God, walking in three persons. He said the Holy Spirit and the, the Son. He saw the one. His son, his mother and the rest are the, the, are the spiritual elements of the church now. So he is believed to still be alive, but he is the God that sends people, he is the God that can, you know, send it on a mission to England, and then you die away, you are on a mission in England, or somewhere else. So Lumba Lumba book is even in Ghana, the people in Ghana believe so much, you can send it on a mission in Ghana, and some people claim to have seen somebody who died here in Ghana, he who died in Nigeria, in Ghana, they claim so. Being God, he has sent you on a mission to Ghana. And they see some members there, they claim so. But nobody can, uh, as a scholar, I don't have to pass the new judgment. Yeah, anyway, uh, I, I recall that now even in other traditional societies, there's this concept of reincarnation, even in our own Baluba, that we have a yes. and things like that. What, what Ubu has done man, is to be able to either consciously or consciously to borrow elements, draw elements from. Hinduism, Christ, uh, Hinduism, and uh, uh, traditional religion, and to try to dedicate it with Christianity, with the Christian doctrine, and sometimes to reject. Either he either rejects freely or otherwise, and he takes elements that are suitable to it. You know, this eclectic, it's just like even if the cost of to do eclectic use of the Bible. He, you know, he does eclectic use of elements in the Bible that suits him. As the celebration of the Mother Day that was predicted, the Queen Mother in Revelation, which is there in my work, in full detail. Yeah. So he's believed to be God. That is why people, you know, you find members writing that oh, 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 out of their doors, and that was enough to send away thieves and robbers, not to get near them, or evil people not to get near them. Mm. But one day, Obu himself, when he was in his good mood or bad mood, Question them that you put my name. Oh, 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 am I your security? Why do you use me carelessly outside when you are not uh, fully committed to the church activities? For members who are not, not, not involved in the church activities, you know he appears to them at different places in classroom. Some of many of them are paying white uniform in Sudan without reading to take exam. As soon as they, they read some, you find some papers written. Oh, oh, oh. And you know, they so much believe in him. But he goes from this area unconsciously, or I don't think, but I think it's unconscious because he's not a learned person. 
I think he claims to not to have gone to school. And he claims also to convince his members that he was born in 1918 when we had that a worldwide epidemic, influenza. Mm. And at the time he was born, he was the cleansing spirit <laughs> that cured the whole world. Members are trooping in Israel, he has representatives in America here. There's one better in uh, New Jersey. There's another one that is a big one in Washington. Mm. Uh, so you are talking about the, the, the number, the numerical strength. There are so many that I can cover. Now they have gone into South Africa, Cameroon. But many will talk about this. They show you that it's a very strong movement. Yeah, you know, you've talked uh, about this. Good spread. organization, you know, you're well organized. Okay. Mm. Oh, thank you so much. Uh, we move on to the video. But uh, what we're saying now is that we shouldn't say because uh, uh, of this kind of it that uh, we should really dump the media totally. We know that uh, you know, uh, there are some good media and the recommendation is that the media has a duty to perform. And um, for example, recently in Nigeria, we, there was this uh, one of the uh, states there in Kano, there was a bomb uh, explosion where some vehicles in the motor, motor park. A uh, lot of buses that were really preparing to, uh, you know, to travel up with a lot of passengers, you know, from the north to the south. About four or five vehicles were bombed, and immediately that happened. Some of the media houses, you know, began to say that the that is enough that southerners were, be, were were being killed in the north, you know, and that generated a lot of problems. And then you find that in the south. There was this move to begin to um, uh, attack the northerners that were there, you know, you know. But then, at the end of the day, when the list of the dead came, it was uh, seen that most, of the very, very um, few numbers of southerners were even among the dead. Most of them were northerners. You know? but, but then, before then, you know, there was a lot of problems. You know, the, um, the south east grew up to say that you know they were going, they were ready for a kind of a conflict and all that. So um, the, the press has to be very, very careful all the same to, to, sure that, to make sure that you know, it's not being used you know, um, in a negative sense and to contribute to peace and unity. I'm still maintaining that in some way, by the time information gets to people, when information came from other media houses, they were not able to realize that there was no need for um, any war or battle or any uh, conflict as um, what happened is not anything to do with um, ethnicism or, or, or that. And uh, so all the same, um, we cannot also say that we don't want the, the press to be independent because um, you know, that, that it, that it, they are not the best solution, the only solution to everything. We still need information and there's no way information, we have to now look at the information that we get and we receive and try to you know, make, make sure that to find out which is positive and which is negative and so that uh, we'll be able to the press can still uh, we know there's corruption in the country you know in nigeria and some other countries as well it's not just nigeria corruption is everywhere because uh, corruption has to do with two people the giver and the taker you know so and if there's corruption we know that um, exposing it does not mean um, that uh, you have to eradicate I have not proposed that uh, the media can eradicate uh, corruption. I'm saying that if it's exposed, it goes a long way to help situation in Nigeria. We remember that recently there was this issue of uh, bribery at the high level in the uh, National Assembly. And we, we discovered that uh, the whole world knew about there was a lot of debates on it. Everybody debates here and there. It was exposed. I'm sure that those who are involved were ashamed of themselves. And then, you know, it's now goes to say that as we move on, when these things are exposed, and we, they, are, they are gradually being exposed anyway by the press, the media is being able to speak more, you know, to expose these things, and it may reduce reduce the, the level of corruption. It may reduce it, you know, rather than just uh, not exposing at all. But exposure may not be a full eradication, but it may reduce. 
Thank you so much. Uh, I'm um, okay. Take it off from there. Actually, I want to. I would like to start with the issue of your case before I not talk about the other two persons. I just wanted to say that I actually talked about the issues of the scriptures of democracy. I didn't really go into it. I just said it because I wanted to lay a foundation for why we need ICT driven uh, electoral transition system and to show where the pressure is coming to the judiciary. Of recent, there have been challenges as to um, whether the petition itself is not for the highest bidder. And I was trying to give a background analysis of what makes the pressure on the judiciary so strong, and at how the judiciary could also get itself out of the mess. Now, my position is that I understand quite clearly, even in the paper I've tried to mention some of the limitations of ICT, we are not saying that ICT is the ultimate. In actual fact, in an ideal situation, the human beings are supposed to be the ones driving the system. But we are saying that, look, why don't we bring in the issue of transparency into the system by using ICT? ICT, what is the ICT? Is not the, we know that people can hack into the systems. We know there are infrastructural problems. I'm aware of all that. But I know also that we cannot shy away from making use of these facilities by starting Using the, by starting to use them and ensuring that through them we can expose issues. Now, a court cannot just determine disputes in election petitions without having concrete evidence. Now, if somebody claims there was an election in Oshun State and so much problem, they have to bring in experts, forensic experts, to come and check the votes cast. And it was alleged that quite a number of uh, few people voted several times. There is the issue of ballot box being snatched. There is a, so there are a lot of issues which one was trying to highlight. But look, we are saying, okay, even though it might be to some extent expensive to introduce ICT into that system, but then the Constitution also makes it important for us that if we are going to adopt democracy, then we must embrace it by allowing it to be properly institutionalized in the different sections, sectors of government. The judiciary is just an arm of the government, but they have a very strong role to play in it. Now, coming back to Kenya, I'm not saying that ICT will not bring this, disputes must definitely come to court. But in courts, decisions, what is justice? Justice is who has the preponderance of evidence. Now, what we are saying now is that if we go by way of electronic voting, we can also see what you are voting. You know also you can do e-discovery. If somebody manipulates the system, what's quick, they will walk the shadow. They will, you, can, you, can identify, you can see it. So now, what we are saying is that let us propose that, look, let us have it in three places. I don't know whether that's how it's a place in Kenya. But I'm saying that the database must not be resident in one institution. Let it be resident in three different places such that they can be used to corroborate one another. And then if you find that there have been some discrepancies, it is easy for the court to disbelieve the evidence brought by a party. For instance, they talk about the number of voters exceeding the number of people registered. These are basic arithmetic things that should not even come to place at all. Then finally, Talking about whether that, that will not be a problem in our system, the truth is that we have no choice, but we must start from somewhere. After all, we cannot, if you have the whole world is changing, things are changing. If you want to move forward, we must adopt it. Not to start, but enlightenment has to also go along with it. So all these things are very, you can be made as simple as possible. Okay? Asking you to put your hands on the this and taking your it's not anything that requires much intellectual understanding. So, so obviously it's a matter of at least having the will to do it. If you know you want to practice democracy, then you must make it as transparent as possible and as more as believable as possible. But most importantly, this part is meant to help the aspect of identification of this over this place, to make sure that look what evidence do we have in court. The evidence that you have is something that is 
most reliable. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. So we'll quickly take the next round of questions. Mm. Uh, thank you very much. I uh, want to start from the media, essentially as it as affects uh, security and peace. Uh, you look at what most people believe to be news within the media. You know, I believe is when you play leaves here for New York and landed civilly, is no news. Or when it leaves and crash, that's a very big news. In that way, the media within our system that she's talking about, we only go in providing more insecurity, and that has been done. Generally, people talk about freedom of the press. Those talking about the freedom of the press are only seeking it for that selfish interest. Because one of the greatest contributors to corruption is the media. That's why today, those who have a very, very bad situation at hand and have money or something to give to the press, they are suppressed. And within our country, the press is predominantly dominated by Southwest. That's why you see even most <coughs> negative issues being aired by the news and the press are either those who are Westerner and anti-West or who are from another section of the country. To my own belief, much as I believe that press should be very free, press are part of, the media are part of the system, are part of the country. What needs to be done in other sectors is what needs to be done even within the press. And as a security administrator, the press over the years have been a major problem to even ensuring that peace is maintained. Because where one person is injured, the press can cry that three people were killed. And that triggers crisis in other areas, just like he mentioned. But if you're talking about the freedom of the press, we'll be talking about objective reporting of the media. And that's the only way we can move forward. Then I, I, I go to... Yeah, yeah. to No, yeah, I, yeah OK, it's going to be short. On the issue of the electoral, the ICT on the uh, judicial system we talked about, but your people only talk about, you talk about only the voting. There are still other issues within the, listen, we talk, no? You didn't mention it. Yeah, when you talk about. I still talk about the procedures of the courts. Well, when you, 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 you're only talking of, of the procedures of the court. There are still some other pre-court issues. Like, if you fall within certain age limits and we see people contesting that going to court, I still think I know and do other things. Hmm? I think I know other, other things. Yeah. We have seen people who are constitutionally... Or you, you have anything on that? And uh, on the issue of uh, the Olumba, I want to believe that maybe what the faith stands for is to borrow from all and maybe have something different from Christians that you talk about. Yes, yes, because the religion in any way has not in any way tell us some of the moral benefits that can be of assistance to maintaining peace and security in, in the country. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yes, thank you. So much. I think I just I'm here. Who's there? Yeah, the, the next person you want to take is this person. I don't know. Come to you again. I just want to address my question. I know some of the things I would have said have been said, but like uh, the last speaker said, and the chair also mentioned it, the seeming syncretization of the movement to me is like the leader wants to be seen and worshipped. Because if he wants to actually reform Christianity and adapt it to uh, African tradition. Why following from the different religions? And if anything is, if 
the traditional religion is okay. Why are you uh, uh, dropping it and going for all this? I feel that the motive behind the religion, you may not have actually touched it. And I feel the motive is the person himself to be worshipped. I don't know if you actually dealt with it. criticize government, but it's more in an indirect way without explicitly naming Kampari's regime. For example, uh, in an article in an Islamic periodical, they used the Caliph Umar II uh, that was presented as an example of good governance in, a, in the context of the presidential election. So it's, it's not a big threat yet. Thank you so much for this conversation. <laughs>